We think of the Book of Le Smorne as a Gaelic manuscript, which, of course, is what it is. But, as is the case with many other medieval Irish codices, not all of its contents are exclusively Irish. There is some Latin here and there. Thus, the first text whose beginning is preserved in the book commences with the biblical verse, Populus qui sedebat in tenebris, vidit lucem magnam. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. The presence of such phrases, especially at the start of religious texts, is commonplace. The Book of Lismore is considerably less usual, though, in that it also contains specimens of another language entirely, in its copy of the text in Tangavith Nua, or the Ever New Tongue. Before looking at these, I should say a little about the work that contains them. The Ever New Tongue is by no means widely familiar nowadays, even to most students of medieval Irish literature. For hundreds of years, though, it enjoyed very considerable popularity. Although the oldest recension survives only in a single copy, that in the Book of Lismore, other versions are attested in over 50 manuscripts, dating from the late 14th century to the early 20th. The work's popularity in the Middle Irish and early Modern Irish periods is reflected in references to it in poetry, and parts of the text were rendered into Latin, apparently for an English readership, in the 12th century. What was the subject matter of this obscure bestseller? It would not be too wide of the mark to say that the ever-new tongue is an explanation of everything. Consisting, supposedly, of the words of the soul of the Apostle Philip, sent by God to a great assembly of Hebrew wise men and other notables, its two points of focus are the creation and the destruction of the universe. In the course of expounding these things, and thereby clarifying, so we are told, all that had been left unclear in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, Philip tells us what was happening before the creation, what the material was out of which God made the cosmos, how it is that the human body is a mirror of the universe, what regions the sun shines upon during the night, and the fantastic peculiarities of different kinds of seas, rivers and springs, precious stones, stars, trees, birds, and remote branches of humanity. You will be gathering that the ever new tongue is a fairly flamboyant text, and this can certainly be seen on the level of style. Here is the account of Philip's first appearance, as it's given in the Book of Lismore. Suddenly then, when it was the end of the eve of Easter, Something was heard, a noise in the clouds, like the sound of thunder, or it was like the roaring of fire or of the sea. At the same time, it was a thunderous wind. Suddenly, something was seen, a sun-like blaze, like a radiant sun in the midst of the noise. That bright sun-like blaze was turning upon itself, too fast for the eye to follow, for it was seven times brighter than the sun. Suddenly thereafter, something was heard, for the eyes of the host were gazing upon the noise, for they thought that it was a sign of the judgment. Something was heard, a bright voice which spoke in angelic language. Eli abia felebethe Itea temnibise salis sal. That is, listen to this tale, sons of men. I have been sent from God to speak to you. Immediately, weakness and fear fell upon the hosts. 
it was not terror without cause. The sound of the voice was resounding, like the shout of an army, but at the same time it was brighter and clearer than the voices of men. It roars above the encampment like the howling of a great wind, which, at the same time, was no louder in each man's ear than the words of a friend, and it was sweeter than music. This dramatic description centres upon the exotic words Ele abia felebe fe, etea temnibise salis sa. What kind of speech is this? As we've seen, the narrator describes it as angelic language, belra nanglekta. And the wise men of the Hebrews say, let us learn from you in what language it is that you speak to us. Philip responds, the language in which I speak to you is that in which the angels speak and every rank of heaven and sea creatures and beasts and cattle and birds and serpents and demons understand it. And that is the language which all will speak at the judgment. It is natural to associate exotic language with secret knowledge and with supernatural powers. We can even see a bit of this attitude in the Greek of the Gospels, where Christ is portrayed as accompanying various of his miracles with phrases in Aramaic. St. Paul goes further when, in the famous speech on love in the first epistle to the Corinthians, he speaks of the tongues of men and of angels. He is referring to language that is not only strange, but supernatural. Such heavenly speech figures in later apocryphal texts, works, that is, that are not part of the Bible, but which purport to reveal further dimensions of the wisdom, mysteries, and sacred history of Judaism and Christianity. Thus, there are references to the language of the cherubim, the heavenly language, the language of those on high, and the language of the people of heaven. Occasionally, as in the ever new tongue, we are given samples of this speech. The apocryphal book of the resurrection of Jesus Christ by the Apostle Bartholomew, for example, relates that the Saviour came into their presence, mounted on the chariot of the Father of the universe. He cried in the language of his divinity, Mari Har Mariath, which is translated as Mary, mother of the Son of God. Now Mary understood the meaning of that speech, and she said, Rambune Kathiathari Miuth, which is translated as the son of the omnipotent, the master, and my son. Most of the texts which mention speech of this kind, or which provide examples of it, were composed in late classical Egypt, indicating, as does other evidence, that one of the main sources of the ever new tongue originated in this milieu. Out of all the multiple versions and many manuscripts of the ever new tongue, the copy in the Book of Lismore is the only one to preserve the passages of angelic language. Where do they come from? Do they belong to a real language? Or can they be recognized as distortions of a real language? What, if anything, can we say about them? In all, there are 13 such utterances in the ever new tongue, together with a similar speech uttered by a dying man, which is evidently intended to be Hebrew. Scraps of imitation Hebrew are also found in earlier apocryphal works, including the Acts of Philip, which has been identified as another of the sources of our text. In the book of Lismore, these passages are consistently written in enlarged script. 
This treatment is traditionally accorded in Irish manuscripts to the words of the Bible or of some other text regarded as possessing special status and importance. Here we can see the Latin of the Vulgate Bible itself being dwarfed by Philip's celestial words. Similarly, in the Coptic Apocryphon, from which I quoted earlier, the passages in divine language are marked as being special, in this case with superposed horizontal lines. The various speeches in the ever new tongue share a common character, a point to which I return, but they do not at all resemble such divine words as I was quoting earlier, and they do not look much like any other language either. When Whitley Stokes published the first edition of the text in 1905, he sent copies to friends and colleagues who were experts in various disciplines, asking if they had any explanations for the angelic speech. A renowned Hebrew scholar, Moses Gaster, replied, the gibberish, or the language of the angels to which you draw attention, is not Hebrew. I, for a while, thought it might be Arabic, but on looking again very carefully through the various passages, I had to give up that idea. Still, it is a problem which ought not likely to be set aside, and it is this which strengthens me in my belief that we are dealing here with a remnant of that old heretical literature, which is full of names and sentences in a mysterious, the so-called sacred language. I think that the problem calls for a different approach. A couple of the words, Eli, and even more obviously, Maria, have clear scriptural counterparts the rest cannot be paralleled either in any actual language of which I have any awareness or in any esoteric pseudo language. But if considered on their own terms, they exhibit some noteworthy characteristics. Some words recur in different passages. Alea, Fuan, Nistien, Tibon, Wide, in some cases, the spelling is different, but the sound was probably intended to be the same, an intriguing indication that these speeches were intended for the ear rather than the eye. Albe, Ale, Alme, Bea, Ethi, Falia, Favne, Fun, Itho, Limbe. There are recurrent endings. B, Isse, Ne, Te, Ten, Os. All of these features display a certain degree of internal coherence in the corpus, such as one could find in a real language. But there is another trait that seems to me to speak strongly against any such reality. A number of words seem like versions of one another despite significant differences of structure. Such are Firbia and Fribe, Flanis, Flaune and Flulis, Intoria and Ituria, Nablea and Nimbile, Tamne and Tebne. Some of these variations could be explained as being due to scribal inadvertence, but I do not think that all of them can be plausibly accounted for in this way. Such an explanation would certainly not fit the largest such grouping. Abelia, Able, Alba, Albe, Alibme, Alimbia, Alma, Alme, Ambile, Ebeloia, Ebile, Elbie, Elobi, Erolmea, Inbila. I suggest that these repeated patterns, occurring in ways that do not seem to reflect the structure of a language, can be understood as evidence of invention. Certain sounds came naturally to the author's inner ear, and so we find them again 
and again in varying configurations. In brief, the author made them up. This may seem a banal conclusion, but for my own part, I do not find it so. The author was a man of broad, if idiosyncratic, learning. He could easily, like his predecessors, have contrived sequences of garbled Greek and Hebrew. Alternatively, he could simply have copied what he found in the Acts of Philip, which, as I've mentioned, was one of his sources. But he did neither of these things. Rather, he seems to have opened himself to his own unconscious, and to have written down what arose spontaneously in his mind. He may even have been endeavouring to replicate the phenomenon of glossolalia, or speaking in tongues. In any case, it appears evident that he wanted to present a language which is not any of the languages of this world. What he achieved more than a thousand years ago has been uniquely preserved in the Book of Lismore.